Welcome back to Discrete Math. We're going to look at the inclusion-exclusion principle. Uh, some of you may have this in your first course, other people they'll wait till the second course, but this is probably more generalized than something you would have dealt with in your introductory Discrete Math course. So, where is the motivation? Well, if you recall, the cardinality of A or B is equal to the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B minus the cardinality of A intersection B. And if we take the union of three objects, we can extend this a little bit further and we get a law that looks like the following. So we want a system that generalizes even further and doesn't necessarily deal explicitly with sets. So what we have is the principle of inclusion exclusion more general. So I need to define some stuff because we're not dealing with sets anymore. Instead, we're dealing with conditions. So C1, C2, all the way up to Cn will be conditions. And we have this n here. n basically means the number of elements. So if we have n of C1, we have the number of elements that satisfy C1. If we have two conditions, n of C1, C2, then these are the number of elements that satisfy both C1 and C2. We can also have complement laws, which are very important for inclusion-exclusion, and that is if you have n of C1 bar, that is the number of elements that don't satisfy C1. Now what's more interesting is when we have n C1, C2, and a bar over each of these, what's important to know here, this is the number of elements that are not C1 and not C2. This is different from the following. If we have N of C1, C2 bar, where it's over both of them, this is the same thing as the number that are not C1 or C2. So this is a little bit different. So we're not going to deal with that. Instead, we're going to be dealing with this situation here. So what is this similar to? Well, when we take a look at n of not C1, it's the same thing as the total number of elements. Sometimes we say S for our universe here or a U. And then we subtract all the conditions that fulfill C1. So. This is very similar to set theory, where we have C1 as the first set and not C1 as the outer set. I know this might not seem necessary to explain, but it's good to get an idea of what exactly is going on here. So if you have A bar, this is equal to the universe minus A. This is just an exact analog to what we're doing. All right, so when we have a situation where we want the number of elements that are C1 bar, C2 bar, well, it's going to be the universe minus C1, C2 plus C1, C2. So this, this might be a little bit confusing at first, but what we're looking at, we want to find all the elements that do not satisfy C1 and they don't satisfy C2. So we want to find this area right here on the outside. So what do we have to do to do this? Well, if we have n, we want to count everything once. So this whole thing is counted. Now, because the whole thing is counted, let's say we have this element here, so this element in the middle is counted. Well, we have to subtract c1, so now it's counted zero times, and then we have to subtract it from C2 because we don't want C2 being counted. So now we're actually counting the middle area negative one times, and that's not okay. So what we do is we add it back, so it goes back to being added zero times. So a little bit more confusing because instead of looking at, say, A or B, we're looking at not A or B. We're looking at the outside area. So this is why we start with the universe and then subtract instead. So that's a little bit of a difference there. 
So what can we do with this? Well, I'm going to give you one example in this video, and then the next video will just be all practice questions. So we're going to determine the number of positive integers less than or equal to 100 that are not divisible by 2, 3, or 5. So let's state our conditions here. Condition 1, we're going to say the positive integer is n. So we're going to say for condition 1, n is not divisible by 2. Actually, we don't want to say n is not divisible by 2. We want to say that n is divisible by 2. Why do we want to say that n is divisible by 2? Well, because we're going to be looking for n of c1 bar, c2 bar, c3 bar. So that's going to be not c1, not c2, not c3. So if we want to write our conditions in the positive. So for c2, we want n is divisible by 3. And for c3, we want n is divisible by 5. Okay, so if we have n of c1 bar, c2 bar, c3 bar. That's just going to be n. And then we're going to subtract n of c1. We'll subtract n of c2. We'll subtract n of c3. So we want to not count those items in c1, c2, and c3. But now we have the items being counted negative times in some overlapping sections. So we have to add back n of c1, c2, n of c1, c3, and n of c2, c3. But now we're counting the very middle element once. So we have to subtract n of c1, c2, c3. When you do this in probability, you should be able to make a very quick connection between what we're doing here. So I'm not going to go through these steps exactly every single time. So now, OK, now what, what are all these numbers here? Well, let's take a look at n first. n is the universe, and we have 100 elements in the universe because we're looking at positive integers less than or equal to 100. OK, now let's subtract n of c1, n of c2, and n of c3. OK, how many elements are divisible by 2? Well, if we take 100 and we divide it by 2, that's how many elements are divisible by 2. So what we're also going to do here is we're going to take, I believe it is the ceiling of this number. Let's check here for a second. No, we want the floor of this number. So we're going to take the floor because in this case, when we have 100 divided by 3, for things divisible by 3, well, really what we get is 33.3 .3 numbers. But we know that's not right. We know there's only 33 numbers that are divisible by 3 in that section. The highest is going to be 99. So we need to take the floor of it to make sure we get the right value. Now, n of c3, numbers divisible by 5. Well, there's going to be 100 divided by 5. Of course, we'll take the floor. We don't have to in that case, but it's nice to be consistent. OK, now how do we do these three cases where n is, or the number is divisible by 2 and 3? Well, it's not that much more difficult since if it's divisible by 2 and 3, then we take 100 and we divide it by 2 times 3 because it's lowest common multiple is 6. So I'll leave it like that just to show the process. And then we want 100 divided by, well, divisible by 2 and by 5. So that should be 2 times 5 here. And then we need to add back the case where it's divisible by 3 and 5. So 100 over 3 times 5. And now the last one here, need to subtract the cases where it's divisible by 2, 3, and 5. So that's 100 over 2 times 3 times 5. Okay, 
Well, now we can compute this into values. We don't have to solve it. This is the answer, but we can give a nice numeric answer. It's 100 minus, well, 100 divided by 2 is 50. 100 divided by 3 is 33.3, .3, but we take the floor. 100 divided by 5 is 20. But we got to add back 100 divided by 6 is going to be uh, 10, 15, 16.67 so we take the floor of that so that's going to be 16 we add back 100 divided by 10 which is 10 then we add back 100 divided by 15 which is going to be 6.66 so we take the floor and that's 6 and then we subtract 100 divided by 30 which is 3 so this is the same thing as 100 minus 103 plus 32 minus 3 so this is going to be 132 minus 106 which will give us a grand total of 26 numbers less than 100 that are not divisible by 2 3 or 5. seems complicated at first but if you're given the same question where it's less than 200 and it says not divisible by 2 5 or 7 it is the exact same process. You can just copy and paste this with different numbers. Kind of cool. All right, so let's generalize this. This seems a little bit complicated and daunting with the notation, but don't worry, it's not that bad. We just extend it further. So if we consider a set S where the number of elements in S is N, and we have conditions between 1 and T, then to say not N, which is equal to n of c1 bar, c2 bar, so on and so forth until ct bar. It's n, so this is the total, minus all of the individual criteria, or all the individual conditions. So this is where there's one in each. Then we add back all the times where there's two. We subtract all the times where there's triplets. And we keep going until the very last one, and depending on if you have an odd or even amount, you'll either be subtracting or adding it. So, this is a very annoying principle to write out in this form. So instead, we can shorten it a little bit. So, this notation is a little bit daunting, perhaps, at first. But, basically... What this says is we take the sum of all ci's. So if you have between 1 between, or i between 1 and t, then that means nc1 plus nc2 all the way up to nct. Now, this notation might seem a little bit weird. So if we have i less than j less than or equal to t, and we have n of ci cj. Okay, so... I shall explain this notation. What this means, essentially here, because we have i less than j, this whole thing ranges between 1 and t, so it's, in with, it's within the conditions. But this just guarantees that i is never equal to j. So we never get a situation where we have c1, c1, because that's redundant. We've already counted it in the first step. It's the same thing as nc1. So we just use this notation to make sure that we never get the duplicates. Same thing over here with this i less than j less than k. This just means that we pick three values between 1 and t, and we don't have any overlapping values. So that's a nicer way to write the formula. Again, if you understand the concept of what we're doing, you don't ever need the formula. It should be pretty intuitive. So, I think for the first time I'm going to prove to you why this works. So, I did the first case with uh, C1, C2. Now I'm going to do it more generally. So we're going to put X, and we're going to put it, say if we have a universe and we have a bunch of different circles or whatever, it's not how it looks. We're going to put x right in the dead center of it. So this is the intersection of all of the different conditions. And we want to see how many times x is counted in this set. Now, 
A reminder, we want x to be counted no times at all because we don't want it included. We're trying to get everything outside these circles. So at the end of this, x should not be counted at all. So how many times is it counted? Well, when we just look at the whole universe there, it's counted once. So this is the same thing as r choose 0. And I should be a little consistent throughout all of these. From i to r. OK, so however many elements there are, or however many conditions there are, we say there are r conditions. It's counted r choose zero times. Now, when we count all of the conditions individually, it's counted r choose one times. Then, when we look at two conditions at a time, that element is going to be counted r choose two times. Now, of course, this is going to be alternating back and forth. So as we keep going, eventually, it's going to be counted r times r, or r choose r times in the final condition. So what we get is we get r choose 0 minus r choose 1 plus r choose 2 dot 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 all the way up to the final condition, which will be r choose r. That might be positive or negative. So why does this work? Well, using the binomial theorem, if you remember this, if we have x plus y to the n, this is equal to n choose 0, x to the n, y to the 0, plus n choose 1, x to the n minus 1, y to the 1, so on and so forth. So if we take a look at the values here, well, we're alternating. So one of them is negative 1 to the r. And the other one, if we take a look at this, must just be 1. So this must be the expansion 1 plus negative 1 to the n. That must be the expansion. So if we have 1 plus negative 1, that's the same thing as 0 to the n, which is equal to 0. So x is counted in total zero times, and it works. That's what we want in our theorem. So there's a proof that inclusion-exclusion works. It's kind of cool. A little bit difficult at first to grasp what exactly is going on, but it is very cool. So next time, we'll just do practice questions. I have four different questions ready. They're all different. One of them is similar to the one in this video, but the other three are different applications, and I doubt you'd see anything different on a test probably the same types of questions. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. And uh, as always, hope to see you guys next time for some lovely practice.